So we believe that when God speaks to us, He speaks to us from His Word. Just as we sang today, Lord, we want to know Your heart. And in His heart is God's Word. So we believe that every time we come together, we will encounter His presence as we worship Him. We're going to encounter His Word as we listen to the sermon being preached. And we're going to encounter His people, that is us, as we greet each other in fellowship. So that's why we get together. That's why our young adult ministry, we're calling it Encounter. We want to have a generation who loves to encounter the living God, to encounter Him through our worship, to encounter Him through everything that they do. That's our desire. So God's heart for us today is found in Colossians 2, verse 6 to 9. So if I could ask everyone to stand up as we read together. So then, just as you receive Christ, Jesus Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. Father God, thank you for your word today. I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that we will all be encouraged and challenged and we'll be able to do what you want us to do and learn what we need to learn today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Can we have the, that last verse um, up again? The context of what we're reading here is Paul is re, um, writing to the church in Colossae. And Paul wrote to the church to fortify against false teachers. So there was false teachers in the church who was trying to impose strict rules about eating, drinking, and religious festivals. Basically, there is false teacher teaching wrong doctrine, false doctrine. Perhaps you and I, we don't think of Doctrine is not part of our normal con conversation or vocabulary, but these are just wrong teachings that the church was facing, and, and Paul was trying to denounce that. We see here at verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than Christ himself. See, this tells us, this means that there are people in the church who've been captive, who've been taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophy. How many of you here would like to be taken captive by someone else, someone to control your mind, someone to control how you think, how you behave? Because how we think, our worldview, our, uh, our behavior depends on how we think. So there are people in the church at that time was actually being captive in their thoughts. I believe this is still happening to us today, that we are also being held captive by things that are not of Christ. You know, um, these might be uh, stereotypes, or not stereotypes, but just let me give you the example, okay? When I was growing up, my parents or my mom says, you have to finish all the food on your plate. All the rice needs to be gone. If not, what happens? If you leave 10 pieces of rice, your wife is going to have 10 pimples. So you have to finish all your food. That's been indoctrinated, so I have to eat everything on my food. But now when I'm growing up, it's like, hey, um, what's the English word here? Um, you know, it says, I'm trying to find the English word, and it's all being made. Now that when I'm with my parents, if I'm, you know, there's still food, it's like, oh, you know, sayang tubu. You know, watch out for your body. You need to be healthy. You know, so, so it's, I'm kind of, you know, it's like when you're younger, you need to finish your food. But when you're older, it's like, hey, you got to take care of your health. But that's like a little thing. But if we're not careful, just little things that could be indoctrinated in us, it could change the way we live. You know, in, in America, it says, knock on wood or cross your finger. As if we would knock on wood, something bad's not going to happen to us, right? We're here in Asia. Most buildings don't have the fourth floor because in Chinese, four means death. So there's no fourth floor, or there's no 13th floor. And as Pastor Dave taught us here, there's no such thing as the one. That changes the way we live. Because if you're looking for the one the whole entire life, you've been indoctrinated, there's only one person for you. And when you don't marry that one person, you got second best or third best. But we learned that 
There's actually, there isn't the one. We become the one. See how little things, if we don't compare them to God's word, it could change the whole, the way we live, our worldview. That's why at Romans 12, verse 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed of the patterns of this world. When I read this, I thought the patterns of this world says, oh, it's just don't, don't copy the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to be renewed by our mind because there are certain things that we grew up based on our traditions or based on our culture that are against the word of God. And the church in Colossae, Paul was saying, don't be captive by these things. That's the first thing that we need to learn here. Secondly, we continue on. We're going to go backwards now. We're going to go back to verse 6. It says, so then, just as you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. What does this mean, to continue your lives in him? It means to st- connection with him, to stay connected with Jesus as Lord. They are to walk in Christ in the same way that they originally received their faith, which is in faith through Christ. That's how that church started. See, the Gnostic teachers wanted to introduce them to new truths for Christian maturity. And Paul was denouncing that. That's what the letter is saying. Paul was saying, you started with Christ, you need to continue with Christ. You started with faith, continue to live out your faith. Your, their doctrine, their theology, their belief must be connected to Christ. Their behavior must be connected to Christ. Their ethics must be connected to Christ. All areas of their lives need to be, needs to be connected in and through Christ. That goes for the same for us as well. Is every area of our lives connected in and through Christ? This is the only way to have spiritual progress. We all want to grow spiritually. Spiritual progress is made in Christ and through Christ as Lord, not just as Savior. Let me say that again. If we want to grow spiritually, we need to grow in Christ as our Lord, not just our Savior. Because we all want Jesus the Savior. If you've gone to an evangelical, one of those night rallies, hey, God forgives your sin. No matter what you've done, if you come to him, he'll forgive you. The famous verse, 911, if you confess your sins, God is just. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse your way. Everybody wants that because we all make mistakes and we all still sin. We all love Jesus as the Savior. Yes, we welcome Jesus as the Savior in my life. You're my Savior. But is he your Lord? Can we say today that Jesus is not just our Savior, but he's our Lord? In order for us to grow spiritually, in order for us to, to go against the false doctrine, we need to make Jesus as our Lord. That's why it says, just as you have received Jesus Christ as Lord. Romans 10 verse 9 says this. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Some of us need to repent in here, including myself. It is very hard to always continually have Jesus to be the Lord of my life. As I continue to be a little bit older, I'm 40 years old right now, and as I continue to walk with God, I realize a lot of times the enemy is not Satan. The enemy is myself. I realize the biggest struggle is that I want to be my own little Lord of my life. I want to be in control of my life. So I realize it's a struggle for all of us. But we are reminded today that Jesus needs to be our Lord. Every single aspect of our lives needs to be connected in and through Jesus Christ. And that's how we grow spiritually. Paul continues, and he uses four metaphors. Verse 7, it says, Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. We're going to look at these four things To encourage them in in their Christian growth, Paul reminded them of these four things. We're going to take a look at um, the word rooted, the word build up, strengthened, taught, and overflowing. The metaphors that we're going to use is a tree, a building, a school, and a river. Okay, So we'll start with the tree. It says to be rooted 
in Him. To the church, when they receive Christ in faith, God rooted them in Jesus Christ. It is God's Word. So when we receive Christ, God roots us in Jesus Christ. See, the tense uh, Greek here is, is that once and for all, having been rooted, it is God who has rooted them in Christ. Paul is saying that Christians should not be tumbleweeds. You guys know what tumbleweeds are? You know, like if you go through the desert, there's just tumbleweeds just flowing everywhere. Whenever the wind blows, that's where the tumbleweeds goes. He says Christians are not to be tumbleweeds that have no roots, are bl blown about every wind of doctrine. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul says, We will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching by the cunning and craftiness of people in the deceitful scheming. Paul wants us to be rooted, to continue to be rooted in God. He also says that, nor they are to be transplanted, repeatedly move from one soil to another. Once we are rooted by faith in Christ, there's no need to change the soil. The church was going back and forth of different doctrines. Paul is saying, stay in Christ. The roots draw up the nourishment so that the tree can grow. It gives strength and stability, necessity to be built up. The second one is to be built up, a building. This is an architectural term, obviously. And the tense here is in the present tense. It's to continue to be being built up by Jesus Christ himself. See, when we trust Christ to save us, we put on the foundation, which is him. He is the cornerstone. Then we grow in his grace. So the being rooted and being built up goes hand in hand. As the believer is being rooted in Christ, we're supposed to go deeper and deeper into Jesus Christ. And as we can grow deeper, then Christ will build us up. The example is perfect example next door. If you ever go to the IES office, if you look at the window, it's, it's just um, they're building something. I think it's been, what, two or three years? Um, they've gone to the point where they're building in the same level as our bathroom. So the guy's bathroom is next to the window. So we had to put a covering because if not, when we go to the bathroom, people who are working on the construction can actually see us. Sorry, I got sidetracked. But the example of the building, for the first two years, it was so boring looking at that thing. All they did was dig. They dig and they dig and they dig and they dig and they dig. Nothing happened. It seems like they weren't doing anything. They dig and they dig and they pour concrete. They dig, they can put concrete. Well, now finally they're starting to build up. But they can't build up unless they have a strong foundation that goes deep enough. So that's the same thing with our faith. Paul is saying that if you don't want to be blown away by all false doctrine, you need to stay rooted. You need to be grounded in Christ. And as you are grounded, Jesus will build you up. Jesus is not going to build us up too high if we don't have the roots. We went to um, Philippines several years back ago through this Asia Pacific Youth Conference. As we were going through up to the mountain, we went through this one area where we saw a bunch of trees. They were all on the side. Apparently, there was a storm that went by, and we saw all these big trees. Seemingly, they are huge trees, but the roots didn't go down that deep. And it was so weird to see hundreds of trees just tumbled over. If we're not rooted, we can't grow up. We can't be built up. Jesus is not going to build us up too big if we're not grounded. He wants us to be stable. So Paul wants to make sure that their foundation is Christ as Lord, that Christ is the cornerstone. What about for us? What's your life being built upon? What's your foundation? Is it Jesus Christ as our Lord or just our Savior? What are we deeply rooted in? Is it our finances? Is it our degrees? Is it our career? Is it our marriage? And for those who are younger or teenagers, is it our girlfriends or boyfriends? Because when we're younger, it's like our relationship is everything, you know? If our relationship is good, life is good. But as we get older, is it our net worth? What, what is it? What are we building up upon? Is Christ Jesus your Lord or not? Next, we look at the word um, strengthen in faith as you were taught. So the idea of a school. See, two, th two things that we need to look here. They were taught, the church was taught the word of God by 
I can't pronounce this. E P A P H R A S. Epipras. We'll just call them E P. Is that, is that okay? We'll call them E P. Okay. So they were taught the word of God by E P. That's number one. Number two, their faith needs to be strengthened. It is the word of God that builds and strengthens the Christian. It is the word of God that builds and strengthens the Christian. Colossians 1 verse 7 says this, You learned it from E.P., our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love and spirit. So there is this disciple of Paul who went to the town, the city of Colossae, start teaching them the word of God, and they believed, they received, and their church was growing. So what we need to learn here is that it is God's word that's going to build and strengthen the Christian. But secondly, strengthen in the faith. How do we strengthen our faith? How do we strengthen anything? We need to exercise. I just came back from Singapore. I went, to, uh, went through a full medical checkup. Uh, it was very uncomfortable. Um, but in the checkup, they check for everything, you know, all sorts of cancer. So praise the Lord, no cancer, everything, I'm healthy. However, the doctor said, you have fatty liver. I was like, oh, okay. So are you a drinker? I was like, no, I'm not a drinker. It's okay. So you just need to exercise. And secondly, you have high cholesterol. So you, do you exercise? I was like, I used to. <laughs> so he reminds me that, yeah, you could lower the cholesterol, just eat fish, maybe chicken or beef once a week. And I, I rebuked them in the name of Jesus, obviously. How can I eat meat only once a week, right? And he's like, but anyway. So what I'm trying to say is that I need to exercise to, in order to be healthy. How do we strengthen our faith? To strengthen anything, we need to exercise. We need to exercise our faith. Faith is the substance of things that hasn't happened yet. So we need to exercise that. We need to exercise God's word. So how do we begin that? By reading his word. If you don't have his word in you, you're exercising the wrong doctrine. If you don't have God's word, if you don't read his word, all the time, even when you don't need it, when you do need it, if it's, if it's not in there, you're going to exercise the wrong doctrine. So Paul is saying that we need to strengthen our faith. Our faith needs to be strengthened through exercise. What do I mean by that? It's not enough just to read the Word of God, to know the Word of God, but James also says that we need to be doers of the Word of God. We could have all the biblical knowledge but if we don't do it, nothing happens to us. We just become pompous or something like that. We just become sombong. Um, so we need to be doers of God's word. So first of all, we strengthen our faith by inputting as much of God's word as possible. Then we need to actually live it out. Live it out. Our faith is strengthened by experiencing God's word come alive in us. And most of the time, it comes through circumstances that we face in our lives. It comes through trials. See, when I, I went to Hillsong Conference several years back, and I heard, I believe it was Joel Osteen's wife, and she says one of the best advice that she got from her, her father-in-law was says, to read the Bible at all times. Even when you don't need it, just continue to read it, because when you do need it, it's already in you. I thought that was such a great word. And Pastor Dave used the example of a toothpaste. If you squeeze a toothpaste what comes out? Toothpaste. So if we have the word of God in us, even when we don't need it, when life squeezes us, what comes out is God's word. So that's how we strengthen our faith. Moving on. So the church received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to be connected in him, to be rooted, to build up, to be strengthened in their faith, and to overflow with thanks, thankfulness. The word overflow here, Paul also uses it as um, abounding many times. It suggests a picture of a river, overflowing. Pastor Dave, um, three weeks ago, said that IES is a river. We need to be overflowing, okay? In John chapter 4, verse 14, it says this. Jesus is saying, whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. He started off chapter 4 saying that it's a spring of eternal life. A spring of water welling up to eternal life. A spring of water doesn't, it doesn't match as an overflowing, right? 
When we think overflowing, we think, yeah, overflowing. A spring is not overflowing. But if we continue to read the book of John, this spring of water should be river of living water that grows deeper and deeper. John chapter 7, verse 37, 39 says this. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scripture declares, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. So when we first drink from Christ, when we receive him, there is a spring of water that, uh, that's in us, welling up to eternal life. As we continue to grow, that spring of water should be rivers of living water. Sad to say that many of us, we're not there yet. We might still be at the spring level, but we are challenged to be overflow, to be overflowing as rivers of water living, flowing from us. So what does it mean here, overflowing with thanksgiving? See, when a believer has a, a, a thankful spirit, we know that he is maturing as a Christian. When a believer is abounding in thanksgiving, we know that he is making progress. Why do we say that? Because a believer who is thankful, overflowing with thankful, uh, this believer knows that God has done something amazing, something good in his or her life. And when we are loved by God, we can't contain ourselves to be thankful, to think of other people. See, by reviewing these pictures of spiritual progress, we see that a growing Christian can easily defeat the enemy and not be led astray by false doctrine and wisdom of the world. That's what Paul was saying. And that's the same message for us today. A grounded, growing, grateful believer will not be led astray. I'm going to say that again. A grounded believer who is rooted in Christ, continue to be rooted in Christ, he's going to be built up by Christ. And a growing and a grateful believer will not be led astray. This is what IES is all about. Pastor Dave had asked me about three weeks ago, you're going to preach last, um, Pastor Mike's going to preach, Pastor Tirza, and, you're going to, and you talk about the young adults ministry, talk about what our church is about, and so we've come to this. IES, that's what we're about here. We want every single believer to be grounded, to be growing, and to be grateful. That's what we want. A grounded believer is a believer who loves God, who is rooted in Christ, who've come to realize that they need Jesus not only just as their Savior, but as their Lord as well. That's the first part. A growing believer is a believer who's going to love other people. They've come to realize, oh, the greatest commandment is to love our God with all that I have. And secondly, just as important, to love who? To love who? Others, neighbors. Let's go ahead. To love God and to love who? Our neighbors. All right. You guys are awake. Awesome. Okay. So that's the second part. Love God is the first part. That's grounded. When you love others, you're growing. And the third part, a grateful believer is a believer who's want to reach the world. IES is about love God, love others, reach, reach the world. When we're grateful for what God has given us, what we've experienced, how He changed our lives, it's so easy for us to join the missions team, to give our time, our talent, our treasure, to join the orphanage, to do something for, uh, for other people. It's so easy because we realize, man, everything that I have, I can breathe, I can live, I can have kids, I have family, my business, it all comes from God. I'm so grateful. I'm ready to not only um, do my part loving God, loving us, I want to reach the world. So that's what we want here in IES. We want everyone, regardless how old they are, to be grounded, to be not kids that are like, no, I don't want to be, no, no, not grounded as a punishment. Grounded, to be grateful, to be growing. So how do we do that? How do we do that as a church? How do we get grounded? Well, we're going to take a look at the analogy of a plant, okay? In order for a plant to grow, we need to have a seed. And that seed needs to be planted. Once that seed is planted and the seed dies, then it has an opportunity to grow and we water it. That's just the natural way of how things are done. So the first thing that we need to do here is that we need to be planted. Psalms 92 verse 13 says this. Plant it in the house of the Lord. Where? Okay, we're going to plant it in the house of the Lord. Where are we supposed to be planted? 
in the house of the Lord. Where is the house of the Lord? Right here. We are in God's house. If we are planted in the house of the Lord, we will flourish. Not only that, we will bear fruit, even in the old age, we'll be fresh and flourishing. So in order for us to be all grounded believers, rooted in Christ, we first need to be planted in the house of the Lord. And to be planted in the house of the Lord means that we need to be planted in what God is doing in and through IES. Not just church membership, not saying that, oh, I, I belong to IES, I'm a member of IES, that's, that's also being planted. But more importantly, to be planted in what God is doing in and through IES. God has been doing amazing things in the last, what, 15, 17 years in this house. He's been changing people's life. He's been transforming life. He's changed my life. He's been a blessing for, there have been healings. There have been weddings. There have been baby dedication. There's been so many things that God is doing in and through his house here. And what we need to do is to be planted in his house. It's difficult to be planted if a plant grows and continuously to being transplanted. Paul was saying that to the church in Colossae, stay rooted in what Christ is doing in your lives, in that church. For us, that means be planted in what God is doing here in IES. We talk about being rooted, we're talking about a tree. Once we're planted, then we can grow deeper into God. We can be rooted. It's so important for us to be rooted as a Christian. Okay? Um, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, Paul says this. He prays from his glorious unlimited resources that God will empower us in our inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in our hearts as we trust him. Your roots will grow down in God's love and keep you strong. If you're a Christian and you're not deeply rooted in God's love, you're going to be weak. New doctrine comes, you're going to fall over. You're going to like a tumbleweed being flown away by all sorts of direction. That's why it's so important for us to be planted in what God is doing, to be rooted here in God's word. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 to 9 says this, Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have the Lord, have made their Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruits. If our roots are deep into God's word, into what God is doing, regardless of the storms out there, if our roots are deep, regardless of what happens in our lives, circumstances, things that we can control, cannot control, we're not going to fall over if our roots are deep. That's why we need to be planted, we need to be grounded, we need to be rooted that's what we want, everyone to be rooted in God's word here in IES. Talking about flourishing. Once we are planted, if we are planted in the house of the Lord, we're going to flourish. What does that mean to flourish? Well, flourishing means that due to the environment, if there's a good environment, a tree can have vigorous growth due to the environment of it. So here at IES, we want to make sure as you come to church, as you are being planted in what we're doing, we want to create an environment that's conducive for you to grow. And how do we do that? We have all sorts of ministries. We have the kids' ministries. We have the teens' ministries. We have the young adults' ministries. You could join the missions group. We actually created a... A, a position called the volunteer coordinator. That's Joy. She's out there. She's going to help you to connect with us and what God is doing in and through IES. We want to make sure everyone is connected. We have step one classes. What is IES? How do you become a member? Step two classes. How do you grow? Step three classes. Um, knowing your spiritual gifts. Preparing you to do ministry. Step four class is about missions. What are we doing here as a church through missions? That's going to happen next week, so please sign up for that. So there's a lot of things that God is doing, but if you don't know what they are, you're not being planted. 
That's why we offer these things. We have the family seminar. How many of you here have kids here under 10 or as a teenager as well? Many of us have kids. God wants us to raise our kids in a godly way. And he's using the people like David and Paula and some of the other pastors, Pastor Mike, to teach all of us how do we do that. So that's what God is doing. That's what, what it means to have a flourishing environment, um, a conducive for growth. We are providing that. We're intentional about creating these things so that we can grow. And we don't want to just be growing vigorously. We want to bear fruit. Bearing fruit means that it's about other people. It's about reaching the world. We want to be planted so that we're grounded. We want to be growing that we could be a blessing for other people. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Before I talk about what is the young adults ministry, uh, I want to have, uh, give you a little story. I think it was a year and a half ago or so, I, I was helping out in the preteens class. How many of you guys know that we have a preteens class? Yeah. So we have a preteens class before be- they become teenagers. They, they, they go through the, the preteens class and they graduate together and they come into the teens ministry together. And I was helping out there and I was seeing, um, it was Teacher K and some of the other teachers, they were worshiping God, leading the kids how to worship God, they have Bible memorization stuff, they have games and things like that. And I had one of those, one of the many God moments from in this church, I had one of those God moments where God spoke to me. You guys had those moments when you're at church, God speaks to you, yes? So I had this moment where the Holy Spirit just allowed me to understand what kids' ministry is about. And the Holy Spirit says, I want these kids to know who I am, who God is, even at this age. I, I'm not explaining this well enough. I, it was, I understand how God is. I understand that He loves me. I understand that He forgives me. I've received His blessing, His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness. I know how much I need God and how much He loves me. But I'm an adult now. And what God was telling me, that He wants to be known to everyone, even at that age. And I was blown away. God wants to be known even to the preteens, and I believe even to the kids. Now imagine if your kids, starting at Kids Church, if they knew God in, like that, if they knew how much God loved them and how God has a plan for them, imagine how their lives would change. See, I don't know how old you are when something just click in your mind. Like, oh, that's who Jesus is. That's what this whole thing is about. Imagine that click happening when they're at kids' church. Happening when they're at preteens. Happening when they're at teens. Imagine their lives being changed. That's what IES is all about. At every single age, we want them to be in the house of the Lord. We want them at that age to be running around, to be hearing sermons, to be hearing the uh, worshiping God, to be hearing hallelujahs and amen, because we know that when they have a genuine and real experience with God, starting at the young age, that they'll continue to follow Him when they become adults. That's our goal as a church. We want everyone to be grounded. We want everyone to be growing and we want everyone to be grateful, to be overflowing with things, 